This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Locally created, nationally celebrated uh, from the northwest to the southeast. This is America's Car Radio Show. It has a throttle. We'll talk about it on air, online, on mobile, or on your smart speaker. This is our auto expert, and I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with our truck girl, Jen. You're a little grumpy this morning. Just a little. Were you? Yes. And then we rode in in your truck. Yes. Which you always talk about, your trucks. You have two. Mm -hmm. Both Chevys. Yep. Both big gas engines my, yes my 2500 and uh, you like you like don't judge me what do you, what don't you like what's wrong you pointed at the board what's wrong echoey oh how about now is perfect that, okay oh no, that's worse no that's echoey <laughs> we were fine the first time i think the echo's in your head no <laughs> why are i allowed to judge your truck no i said don't judge that it's not in perfect condition in the inside uh, i've been busy this week it's not perfectly clean does it any different any other time? Yes. Is it? Yes. Because it had teddy bears and stuff in the back. Yeah. Well, that's been in there oh, for a long time. Oh. <laughs> I'm suspicious <laughs> that your truck hasn't changed much. I mean, you're very industrious. You have like a garbage sack up front. And that's the law in Washington. What? You have to have a garbage sack in your vehicle? Yes, because if you don't, it's um, intent to litter. That's a second degree offense right. if you get uh -huh. pulled over. This is like a whole show right here. I know. Well, welcome. Well, that's in Washington. Anyways. So wait, if you get pulled over by the cops in Washington State. Correct. And you don't have a trash bag in your car. Correct. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. I can't believe it. Look it up. They no. Just, okay, well, they just. Look, show me. I'll look it up for you. I think then. it's a lie. It's I think somebody's not. like fooled you. You've nope. got, it's an internet scam. No, nope, it's not. If you get pulled over in your vehicle and you don't have a trash bag in it, you it's get a, a ticket. It's a secondary offense. Yes, right. they can give if you If you're a, a law ticket. enforcement in Washington State, call me right now because I think it's a lie. I think it's shenanigans. I think it's the plastic bag industry, the trash can industry trying to make more money out of us. Well, now you're going to make me look it up. Okay. Jen won't be here for the rest of the show because she's trying to find out how she got internet scammed. What is on today's show? Absolutely packed. Uh, we're going to be talking about the event that uh, we just did called Run to the Sun, which is where um, 24 journalists get into 24 cars and they drive them over to about 20, sometimes like 10, but usually around 20, 25 miles each time. And then you swap. And uh, we get to choose the best convertible, the best coupe, the best performance car, the best sun, the best performance SUV, the overall winner. Do you find it yet? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -mm. No, you didn't. And uh, uh, oh. we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about some of the cars that were in that event. We'll talk to Justin from Mazda about the MX-5 Miata, the brand new one, by the way. They just uh, rejiggered the engine. They uh, gave it a few extra horsepower. They put a new transmission in it. You'd think the Miata couldn't get much better, the MX-5. We had the RF, which is the hardtop convertible. That was so much fun to drive. Um, also, we had a Rolls-Royce there, a $428,000 black badge Rolls-Royce Wraith. Uh, we're going to also talk to Brian Armistead today. Uh, he's our friend from the uh, from the Baltimore area, and Brian is a great car reviewer, a, an absolute en enormously tall African American gentleman who is one of my best friends in the world, and he's been driving the Range Rover Evoque. If you ever, if you are wondering about the Range Rover Evoque, uh, he he will fill you in. By the way, I've been driving one this week as well, so I'll be able to point counterpoint him. It'll be like a big political thing. It's uh, September is Accident Awareness Month. So we'll have an opportunity to talk to uh, David Pierceman. He's the founder and lead attorney uh, who will be able to tell us an awful lot about how you d deal with insurance during accidents. One of those things that you really want to know. And uh, the interesting thing about that is um, Volvo have a new, uh, a new app, which is called Care by Volvo. And when you get into an accident and it's the car senses you've been in an accident, it automatically texts you what to do. I mean, after the accident is over, like who to call, what state you're in, what, what stuff to fill out. Well, 
I'll talk a little bit about that. And Anton Wallman's going to join us. He is our independent analyst and investor. Anton is going to talk about the new Porsche Taycan. And we can't get through this show without uh, mentioning the new Land Rover Defender, which was announced uh, this week, which was pretty amazing um, in Frankfurt. Um, we've been waiting for this vehicle. I drove a prototype in 2012 around a dock in New York City. And we've been waiting for a super long time for this vehicle to arrive. Did you see what they came out with? What? The Lego version. Oh, yeah. It's so cute. So I want the real version. <laughs> about you? So I found out the, the law. Okay, go. Okay, apparently it was a $95 fine for not having a litter bag in your car or boat, but apparently it was repealed in July 2003. All right. So apparently I've been driving for a long time because I always 16 have garbage years. Garbage bag 16 years with a gar <laughs> unnecessary garbage bag in hey, your car. You need a bag in your car. You never know what you're going to use it for. I mean, I understand that point, but I wouldn't be putting a garbage bag in my car because it was the law. Well, I always follow the rules. I know, but <laughs> it's like saying you have to drive with one, you know, eyebrow shorter than the other. It seems like fairly ridiculous. Well, now you can't. I mean, don't litter. Well, now you can't drink coffee or anything. That's a yeah, lot. I have to pay attention. You know, in the UK, mm -hmm. I guess this already, but where I come from, mm. in the UK, <laughs> you're not allowed, if you drive a commercial vehicle like a truck or a van, you're not allowed to have food or drink in the front compartment. Yeah. You can't do that now in Washington in a regular vehicle. You can have it in there, but you can't be eating it. Yeah, well, you have to have your hands on the wheels. Yeah. I think it's when you see people driving down the freeway eating their to-go food, it's kind of scary sometimes. I still see Morning people time. on the phone. And Oh, yeah. It drives and, me crazy. And putting their makeup on. Oh, I haven't seen Is that. Is this pet peeve show? Did we decide this was the okay, pet peeve how, show? Okay, how about shaving? I've seen that a few times. Yeah. Guys are just shaving. Yeah, but I guess at a light that makes sense. I mean, if you're a, that much of a rush in the morning, electric shaver. I mean, I hope it wasn't like an open no, blade and, driving. and a sink and foam and stuff. That no. should be illegal. Why? Then I should. Why don't... driving? Oh wait, I, I'm driving. I While guess. you're driving, yes. At, at a light, I get it. Should should ladies be allowed to put their makeup on at a light? Why not? You're at a stop sign or stop light. You're not going anywhere. Yeah, but you see what often happens is the light changes and everyone pulls away and they're still putting eyebrow pencil on. Well, I don't know. Why? I don't need eyebrow pencil. All right. All right. Could have been <laughs> lipstick. Eyebrow pencil was just an example. You should oh, be. You are making you should, me work so hard you today. You should be dressed and ready to go when you go out that door. Oh, shoot. That is. That's I'm going to call your son Stephen and ask him if you're a real growly bear mother. I am not. I'm a nice mom. <laughs> I don't know because well, I'm getting like you should be dressed and ready to go when you get in the car and drive to work in yes. the morning. Right. Be prepared always. Stand by, more show coming up. We're going to talk to Justin from Mazda about the uh, Run for the Sun event and the new MX-5. That's all coming up as our auto expert continues. You're listening to our auto expert. All right, well, you can check out uh, all of our auto expert to catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all the past shows. Our automotive videos are there. Read inside car stories. And, of course, check out your next ride all at OurAutoExpert.com. Spent uh, several days up in Skamania Lodge, which is in Stevenson, Washington. Very beautiful, very rural, very beautiful, with uh, the Mazda Miata MX-5. And uh, joining us on the phone is Justin uh, to talk about this vehicle uh, representing Mazda. The million-selling Mazda Miata gets a powerful boost. The most powerful MX-5 returns with its lightweight routes and fun to drive so uh, justin increased the horsepower by about 26 uh, a little more powerful for 2019 yeah that's right um it's about a 17 percent increase um it's one of the most amazing things that our engineers have done because it's the exact same engine so if you're familiar with the current generation uh a model mx5 it's the same fact as 2.0 be the engine and all we did was kind of fine-tune different components of the engine, um, adjust the exhaust, uh, and basically speed up more so that it could provide more and, you know, give more smiles to fans as they drive uh, these vehicles. But, um, hey, Nick, it's great for having me here. Um, just wanted to touch back on Run Through the Sun. It's just an amazing event. Like, we love the journalists out there. They're very talented. Um, 
the roads are amazing. The weather was actually perfect. You planned a really good time for it. <laughs> it was perfect. To, it was great to bring the Miata there, like the iconic roadster. Uh, I mean, we hit the nail on the head. We sold over a million. It's actually the Guinness World Record for uh, the best selling roads in the world. So we hold this vehicle very, very close to our hearts, um, and we're glad that we were able to bring it out. Yeah, it, what's the secret to Mazda's success? Because the Miata is, I mean, we had a great event driving around to the sun. But why do you think the Miata is so popular? Uh, it just seems like it was the go-to car. Right? We, we had the AVA, the Automotive Video Association, uh, who get to choose the performance car and SUV of the year. And we had it up there for that event. And uh, there, there's some really hardcore fans, and they love that vehicle. So what do you think the secret to the success of the Miata or the MX-5 is? Uh, I mean, I can't give away all the secrets, but if I have to say something, for sure it's the the passion behind all the people at Mazda, from the designers, the engineers, to all the employees. Like, I, out of all, I'm, for, in my opinion, like, there's a passion that goes into every person's work, and it really shows in the vehicle. So um, one of the examples with all Mazda vehicles, not just the Miata, is when we design them, we actually use a big block of clay and, and shave it down to really have the design. So... The designer uses their actual hands to, like, feel the body lines, to understand the way it's going to look, the way it's going to reflect on the light. It's just that extra thinking before it goes into the machine and the mass production. There's a lot of passion built in from the leather that's hand-stitched. Um, all that stuff is attention to details that, you know, people might not notice, but in the long run, it, it develops a big following in a sense. Um, also, Zunyata's been around for 30 years. We're actually celebrating 30 years this year. So we've collected a lot, a lot, a lot of fans over the years. Um, and it's been great. Um, when we first announced it in Chicago Auto Show in 1989, there was a red, white, and blue first-generation Miata. Um, if you were at the Auto Show this year, just other things, we had not the exact same ones, but, well, one of them was the exact same ones, but we had a red, white, and blue of the different generations as we're in the fourth generation. So we had a first generation, second generation, third generation, all red, white, and blue. Kind of pay homage to the original debut. We also debuted um, the 30th anniversary, yeah, which is a racing orange. Um, it's great. It's, and it has a lot. It, it, you know, it's, but, it, that's one of the things that, that's interesting. So we had these 24 journalists who got to drive this vehicle over two days, and you got to sit in the uh, passenger seat for that experience. It, the car makes you want to drive fast. It makes you want to, you know, have a fun time with the, with the hard top down. Um, did you, in that driving experience, did you have some scary moments with some people in there that you just think, all right, calm down, Sally Ann. You need to, you know, take your foot oh. off the accelerator. Do you go crazy, Jen? No, I drove responsibly. Oh, good. Yeah, but I had a blast. <laughs> I had a blast in it, though. It just it just and makes you want to go. Did did Justin? Did you have any times in that car where you were just like people just couldn't <laughs> resist it? Um, well, there were times that people couldn't resist it, but I totally felt safe every step of the way. Um, that's what's great about this car: the perfect balance, the handling. It it's definitely one of those um, you can drive this. You know, you can drive it slow and it'll still feel very fast and exhilarating, um, which keeps everything safe. There's just a lot of, um, a lot that goes into it that, you know, it keeps it nice and nimble. You can turn it whichever way and it'll still, you'll still feel safe and grounded. Plus, the, you know, Nawapo members are very talented. They're very, you know, I respect them very much. And likewise, they respect the Miata. They know how to drive it. They know how it's limits in a sense. Um, and it's, you know, it's with 181 horsepower. You could do a lot, but not so crazy, and you can live. You can feel all of 108 horsepower in a sense, um, and still feel safe. So originally, it debuted uh, with a smaller engine. The first generations of the Mazda Miata uh, debuted with, I think, a 1.6 liter engine. You managed to get a two liter engine into that space. How? How do you think you could get a bigger engine into that space? Because I love 181 horsepower, but now I'm keep thinking to myself. Huh, I wonder if I could get a 2.5 liter engine in there. Car's <laughs> so kidding. light, though, Nick. <laughs> I know. Well, you know me. You don't want to take it of, airborne. Uh, well, maybe I do. <laughs> maybe I do, Jennifer. Maybe I do. Uh, it, it seems we'll like... we wings on it then for you, Nick. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Dukes of Hazard style oh, over some on. railway tracks <laughs> in, in Skamani, Washington. Uh, it, it seems like this vehicle just has an en endless op opportunities. You put the RF, which is basically the hard top, 
uh, on it as well, which makes it great for people who live above the Mason-Dixon line where they have bad weather mm-hmm. and snow. It's a rear wheel drive, so it's extremely enjoyable. There seems to be opportunities just to keep doing things with this vehicle. I mean, looking from the very first generation, which is a very basic inside uh, of the vehicle, uh, you've now has a screen, it has Bose headphone, head, sorry, Bose speakers in the headrests. I mean, the, it just seems to keep going and going with new and more opportunities to grow the brand and grow the car? Oh, definitely. Um, we're always moving forward. We're always looking out to see how we can offer more premium features for our fans. Um, I, I, honest, I mean, that's an engineer question as far as the bigger engine, but honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. I've seen our engineers do some crazy stuff, uh, and it's always come out amazing, and it's always stayed true to the brand, which is a vehicle that has a great driving dynamic while also delivering um, premium features for people of today, in a sense. It's always an updated version. It has all the specific features. It has all the premium features that you want. Um, but as long as you maintain that lightweight, fun to drive, great thing that the Miata is known for, and frankly, all Mazdas are known for, um, then, you know, guys the limit. Hey, Justin, remember when we were driving and I asked you about the speaker system? And do you remember the story you told me? Ah, yes. Um, so <laughs> This is a was, really it's, interesting it's, it's story. It's an interesting story. Uh, so Bose, they're, they're amazing. They work with us very closely. This is both Bose US working with Mazda US as well as um, Bose Japan and, and Mazda Japan working together. Um, and everybody's on the common goal of making the ideal sound for the people inside, from the driver to the passengers. Um, and, you know, everybody's working together. The common thread is sound, but obviously they have to communicate with each other. So um, there's always a language there. Like, how can an American easily say, oh, there's, like, a lot of crackle, there's a lot of uh, booming, there's a lot of hiss, you know, like, kind of sounds that we make that a Japanese engineer might not understand, So and vice versa. So there's, first, there's a language where you kind of have to make a, a um, like, a legend of sorts to understand each other. And then from there, then you start tuning things and working on it. Um, and then obviously, I would say in the U.S. we're very into like pop and hip hop, like at least nowadays, like that kind of music. Uh, while you know in other parts of the country they could be more into classical. It's just a different kind of sound. So the the base to tune in a sense would usually be about you know with classical music, like things like that kind of tone. Um, so that's the base. But then once we brought the Japanese engineers close to Mazda and both to the U.S. and kind of like okay, now we need to pump it up a bit to fit for the pop and um, music. So I think I, I have to go back and check one of the music, but I think there was an uh, instance where the Japanese owners were inside a Mazda, on their laptops listening. Justin, hang on a second. I want to pick us up the other side of the commercial break, but hang on one second. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Justin from Mazda is on the phone. We were talking about... Uh, the, the way the engineers communicate in different languages with the uh, with the Bose systems to explain it. So, sorry, Justin, we had to take a break for that pesky news at the bottom of the hour. Pick up the story. Explain to us uh, again where we were. So, obviously, they had a hard time communicating how crackles and pops happen when you have an, a language barrier. Yeah, uh, definitely. It was definitely an interesting way for them to work collaboratively together. Um, but they made it happen, and as soon as, you know, the tuning was, was being done, um, then obviously you have to adjust it for all different types of music, especially in the U.S. where we're into, you know, pop, hip-hop, some of those bigger bass-hitting uh, music. So uh, I have to double-check the, the what song it was specifically with the engineer uh, that I heard the story from, but if I remember correctly, we had a bunch of Japanese engineers inside a Mazda, doors are closed, you know, in the tunnel, so they can hear exactly what's going on their laptop, very focused. And I believe it was Little John turned down for what? Just blasted up to 11. It was a hilarious moment. It, it sounds like the, the, it's fun. I always, uh, interestingly enough, when I've, uh, I'll be going to Tokyo Auto Show this year, but when I go to these auto shows uh, and we have to get translations between engineers and journalists, what ends up happening is that uh, they have special translators who are also engineers to try and explain things because obviously words don't translate well. 
So uh, it's, it's kind of a creative way around around the uh, the situation. Now, I also wanted to tell you, uh, Justin, congratulations, because uh, the Northwest Automotive Press Association named the Mazda Miata MX-5 for 2019 uh, the best convertible. Uh, the best, the most fun in the sun with the top down, and uh, that that was a pretty uh, good category to win, because uh, you were up against things like the Jeep Wrangler and the um, the Fiat 124. So it's uh, I think people really enjoyed it, and the best part of it for me is the fact that uh, it, it has the hard top convertible. And of course, you know, having a soft top, and people will call me uh, weak, but if you drive around in the weather where it snows and rains and is cold, uh, having a soft top isn't always the best way to get around. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's been, it's two years in a row now, so, you know, we love this Miata so much, and we're glad that you all love it as well. Um, definitely, you know, Portland and Washington, that area has some of the greatest roads to really exhibit a lot of its potential. Um, and it, it's just definitely been a, a great event, and we're honored to to win the award again. Um, yeah, and the competition, it was de- definitely some some unique options there, and uh, you know it really showed the journalists the different ways you can enjoy the sun in a sense. Uh, and we're just glad we were able to take that home again. Um, as far as sorry, what was the, the other thing you mentioned? No, I think I think that was it. I mean, it's it's nice to have that convertible, the hard top convertible, because oh, of the weather. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, you know, we we want Miata has been known as a soft top for years and years and years. Um, and while a lot of people love the Miata, not everybody uh, you know is in enthralled with a soft top in a sense. So we wanted to make sure we had another option that kind of still had the same convertible feel, the same Miata ness in a sense, um, but to cater to a wider range of fans in a sense. Uh, and that way everybody can enjoy them you know, there's one out for everybody basically right and I, and I think that's the nicest thing too although i do really like that brown uh option for the soft top that you have in 2019 that was that's really cool um i'm very weak i get very weak over uh, nice color combinations of vehicles and uh <laughs> and we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, be amiss if we or we would be amiss if we didn't mention the fact uh, that the the red the crystal red paint that you have the metallic crystal red paint that you have on that vehicle is something that was specially developed by mazda having to actually invent a new spraying head so all the pieces of metal lay in the same direction uh yeah uh basically our solid crystal is one of our trademark colors um it's a three-layer paint process it's like a black or red and clear i believe um originally it was meant for only our concept vehicles but everybody loved it so much that we were like we have to find a way to mass produce it um obviously a concept vehicle you're spraying it by hand it's a one-time thing only it's very unique um so it's hard to basically mimic that in a machine where a machine is very very Serialized, it does the one thing and program that way. So we have to actually program little imperfections in the machine to spray as if it was spraying by hand, and basically give it that um, that vibrantness, that luster, um, and as well as because of those imperfections, the way the light reflects on it, you get different feelings basically uh, depending on how the lighting is, how it's go- when it's going through a shadow, going through you know bright sun, um, and it really gives off a, a strong emotion with the vehicle. Uh, and it plays well with the body lines as well, or the lack of body lines. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of cases where it's just nice, big body panels, and you could really see the flow of the vehicle. It, it really helps give it that, you know, that essence of, of going fast without necessarily going fast. It's really good, Justin. Thanks for joining us, and congratulations on your win for the uh, the most fun in the sun vehicle. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk about another vehicle that was at the event, and this vehicle, I can tell you, is two hundred and forty eight thousand versus the vehicle that we drove, the Mazda Miata, which was a lot less. You're listening to our Auto Expert. People often accuse me of. Uh, you know, being a little biased, coming from the UK. Yeah. Do you think I'm biased towards UK vehicles? Mm. I like me some Mini, I like me some Land Rover, I like me some Jaguar, I like me some Aston Martin, and especially like me some Rolls Royce. Oh, who doesn't love a beautiful Rolls Royce? Well, <laughs> the world's premier automotive uh, luxury vehicle, the most premier luxury brand in the world, Rolls-Royce, and uh, Jerry joining us from Rolls-Royce. You uh, you sent us 
a absolutely outstanding, beautiful Rolls Royce to uh, this year's Run to the Sun, Jerry, worth four hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars. We're just talking about the Mazda Miata uh, RF convertible. You could buy sixteen of those, but I much rather, I think, have the black badge Rolls Royce Wraith in my driveway. Uh, this is everything Rolls Royce do amazingly well. Yes, Nick, and I, I'm glad you everyone had a chance to enjoy it. Uh, run to the sun, and it was our pleasure to participate this year. Um, I would venture to guess we don't have a lot of our clients or of the Mazda clients cross shopping those two vehicles. <laughs> no, but uh, you know it's, it's interesting to know that uh, you know one one of them has sold a million, and the other one is is worth a million. It's just incredible <laughs> to uh, the one thing that was you know on everybody's list at this year's Run to the Sun. All twenty four journalists were. It was almost a running start when the uh, when they they came up to drive the Rolls Royce at their turn. Everybody was like, here we go. We've been waiting for this all day. <laughs> it, it was, was exciting. Uh, it was definitely amazing. Uh, it's, it's not, it, is, it is an event. It's it, an event unto itself. It, absolutely. And it's not just about the fine handmade tailoring, but it's all the, also the performance. I mean, when you get something in a V12 engine, Jerry, you can't but have an amazing time. You know, absolutely, Nick. And the, one of the things that people forget about is that a Rolls-Royce is not really a car you know people don't buy a car when you commission a rolls royce and we've had this conversation a few times is it is everything but let not forget that that v you know the the six 6.5 liter v12 engine the transmission the way that it's put together the engineering that goes into it uh it is second to none and one of the reasons we were thrilled to send and share with you black badge this year is Nothing shows you the engineering capability and the image capability of Rolls Royce like a black badge, and nothing drives like a black badge rate. Uh, and th- th- so let's talk a little bit about black badge and and what it means and and how, where it came from because you know you noticed a trend at Rolls Royce with people who were buying your vehicles but they weren't just driving them out of the showroom they were driving them to a shop and doing things to them before they garage them in their in their home right. Exactly, yeah. And we saw a lot of cars where our clients wanted them blacked out. And, you know, it started with the cars being black, blacked out. So they would order a black car, they'd take it into an aftermarket place, paint all the chrome, paint the God help us, paint the spirit of ecstasy, um, and you know, which is fine. That's, if that's what they want, we realized that we needed to meet that demand. Uh, but when we looked at it, we said we don't want to just do it on a cosmetic level. That's not the way Charles Rolls or Henry Royce would have done it. We want to do it really organically. So Black Badge to us is, is two sides of the car. One of it is the cosmetic side, that darker, edgier image. And as you saw in Pebble Beach this year, Black Badge doesn't have to be black. We have the blacked out, uh, the darkened chrome, the darkened spirit of ecstasy. Now, in Rolls-Royce fashion, we don't paint it. We don't just take that and paint it. That, that's not going to be that enduring quality we actually go through a chemical deprivation process where for lack of a better word we smoke the chrome and we turn it dark in an autoclave um, we do that with all the chrome we put on uh, the, the the highest tech carbon fiber wheels that are in the industry i always love to say we can save you a few pounds on your your almost three ton uh, rolls royce um, and it's given a very dark edgier look and that's what our clients were looking for I know. but Yep. You, you drove it, right? Right. I mean, I also the thing that I love about Black Badge is you know, I spend most of my time on the inside of a vehicle anyway. So although it looks stunning when you walk up to it and you see it, but you you, you take the insides and you give it a flare and, and, and you give it sort stars. of... Stars. Yeah. It I mean, had oh, stars in the ceiling. The he- Jen is... <laughs> Starlight she, Headliner. Yeah. yeah. It's she, beautiful. And I also explained to her that air, the Starlight Headliner is actually proper constellations. So every single yep. one is put together Absolutely. with the star in the right place. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Tan done. And on the inside of a black badge, there's two things that make it very unique. One is... We have a technical fiber, a technical carbon fiber using aluminum thread that we reserve only for black badge commissions. And that's something that for that edgier, darker client, they want something that's edgier and cool on the inside of a of their Rolls Royce. But you're right. You know, the, all of the, the black badge, what we do is we encourage the client to go with 
really aggressive poppy colors. I, I literally just got out of one like 10 minutes ago of a black badge wraith, iced Salamanca blue exterior oh. on the interior, black and Salamanca blue oh. highlights throughout the car. Oh. And if, for those of you on, yeah, I know we're on radio, Salamanca blue is like a bright, rich, bright blue. Yeah. So you get this pop back and forth. Um, but we have this, the signature Starlight Headliner, which is ubiquitous pretty much on every single Black Badge rate and every single Black Badge Ghost we make. It's so amazing. It, it, it's, a, it's, this, it's a, yeah, they're, it's an artistic creation. The sound system was incredible as well. <laughs> okay, what station were you listening to? <laughs> Not telling. <laughs> but the subwoofer was in use. <laughs> okay. Well, and that's the thing. You know, we have the bespoke audio. You've got uh, 16 speakers in the Wraith, um, two subwoofers. It's, you know, what we do is we design everything for that specific car. But, you know, we, you know as I said earlier, it's not just about the design. You know, we can take that design as far and as edgy or as smooth as you want to take it. We also made a lot of engineering enhancements to the Black Badge. And what sort of what extra things do does somebody get apart from the colors in in the black badge to get? I mean, with the spirit of ecstasy is blacked out. Obviously, uh, the interior has much brighter colors and the carbon fiber. But is it is it a design element that the black badge offers, or is it a, a step more than that? Well, it's the combination. And what I would say is, when you look at a lot of uh, like car brands out there that have a performance brand, they tend to go. It looks like, you know, Car X, but we have all this performance underneath. Or you'll find companies that will do brands that will do, oh, this car looks really cool with just a few tweaks. And what we've done is we've walked that line. We have half of it, and the most obvious, are all of these, this, this image, this design, this edgier feel, this edgier look. But it's at least the other half of it is the engineering enhancements. And it all starts with the power of a Rolls Royce. You know, you know, every Rolls Royce is extremely powerful. You know, we have um, very, very uh, powerful V12 engine. Typically, we tune that so that it's a very smooth ride. You know, you can even in a race, a standard race, 4.4 seconds zero to 60. It's 4.4 seconds zero to 60 in a very refined manner. Um, with a black badge, we've tuned the engine so that you have faster and higher transmission shifts. So you, you, we pulled the 0 to 60 down to 4.1 seconds. And you're going to feel a little bit more of it. And the, you know, our clients want that. They want to feel a little bit sportier. We've tightened the steering, tightened the suspension. We've uh, increased the um, torque on the Wraith up to 640 uh, pound-feet of torque, feet pound of torque. And we've, um, on the Ghost and Dawn, we've increased as well. We've also increased the horsepower. So you have a more powerful, uh, faster, uh, let's just say it's a bit more dynamic car to drive. Um, and, of course, we put bigger brakes on. So, and because um, if you go fast, you have to stop fast, right? Yeah. You have to stop, you have to stop fast, but you have to stop well. And you know, this is, um, with the magic honestly, carpet ride, you can't have a – you know, magic carpets don't come to a screeching halt. Neither should a Rolls Royce. Okay, no, so they, they, they smoothly glide to a safe stop. Okay, so for people who've never been in a Rolls Royce, let's tell them the cool stuff that's in the inside, <laughs> like the doors and the umbrellas. So coach doors, kind of Jerry. Every Rolls Royce has coach doors, two, at least two. All the coupes have coach doors. Those are the doors that open reverse. Yeah, um, just Jerry, opposed, Jerry, no. Jerry, block your ears for a second. Block your ears for a second. No, don't for say that S word. <laughs> for people who don't know and people who yeah. are uninformed, they call those suicide doors. Right. Correct. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're actually similar, coach doors. They're, they're, they open the same way a suicide door opens. Let me put it that way. A suicide door opens to 90 degrees. Ours don't right. open full 90 degrees. But, yes, they're the doors that open to the reverse, similar to a suicide door. Coach doors, they're big. They give it, make it really easy to get inside, particularly into the coupes the Dawn and the, and the Wraith. Um, when you open the door, in every Rolls Royce, either in the door or in the, uh, the front quarter panel sleeve, there's a, there's a Rolls Royce umbrella, a bespoke umbrella. And that's twofold. So one of them is obvious, which is to protect you from the rain when you get out. And of course, it, when you put the umbrella back in the sleeve, it's Teflon coated and you have a, um, a passageway from the engine compartment that dries it out. Now, Nick, can you tell us the secondary use of the Rolls Royce umbrella? No pressure. Um, it it's used to defend yourself against blackguards and <laughs> rapscallions. 
That as well. Or if you have a young lady dri- riding with you and she's oh, yes. exiting the car, you can ensure that you would not have any paparazzi waiting moments. Right. Um, it's a very, it's a, it's a chauffeur's tool. Excellent. Um, and that's one of the things. So it's, you have the umbrella, you have the coach doors. Um, I think you should, you know, I think we've discovered something here. I think you should have a sword in the middle of the umbrella. <laughs> like a James Bond well, we, type yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, Nick, great. We offer unlimited bespoke options. So we, we're going to have to get you in with our bespoke designers in, in Goodwood, home of Rose Hurts. I'm wondering, I'm going to see if I can get a sword umbrella and then send it to them, and they could probably make it an offering of having one. Unfortunately, in the UK, you're not allowed to have anything over a three inch blade in your vehicle, but <laughs> it's not technically in your vehicle, is it? Oh as, as we say, um, we will bespoke anything into a Rolls Royce that is legally possible. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave. Oh. We'll end this discussion. <laughs> okay. So back to the the car. So the lambs will. Oh, so floor. carpet lambs yeah. will carpet right. Uh, made to yeah, drive with I, your I, shoes off. I always encourage everyone to take their shoes off the moment they get in the car and enjoy the lambs. Well, four inch lambs wool carpets. The. Um, one of the things I love about Rolls Royce is the, the huge potential to bespoke the, the leather combinations. And, you know, for your listeners, go in when you're, if you're going to buy a car, go in and say, oh, I want to change the colors on the interior and just see the reaction. When you're bespoking a Rolls Royce, you can not only change the color combinations on the interior, you can change where, where you put them. You can have four or five different colors on the seat. And I've seen some really, really creative um, artwork done with the leather. And, of course, our leather is all um, the highest-grade leather. It comes only from bulls. Um, bulls don't have stretch marks, except for the fat bulls, which we don't. We don't. <laughs> they, come, they come from altitude. They're all raised at altitude in Europe, uh, above the line where there's mosquitoes. And they cannot be raised on uh, branches where there's barbed wire. Wow. We do everything we can to have the perfect, the perfect, and we inspect them when they come in. Uh, the typical Rolls Royce will use between six and eleven bull hides. You know, with the Phantom using, I think it's eleven or twelve now in the new one. Um, Jerry, I think I'm going to have to. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to have to sit down. You're making me dizzy with all this stuff. <laughs> Uh, we're running. We're, yeah. we're we're fastly running out of time. We're going to crash into the news. Okay. Uh, but I will tell you that every opportunity, I'm trying to invent opportunities in my head. I will uh, I will drive a Rolls Royce. It's and amazing. The best luxury vehicle in the world, Jerry from Rolls Royce. Thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Nick. Thanks, guys. And uh, we will of course post uh, pictures of the Rolls Royce uh, online at ourautoexpert.com. Coming right back with more on this week's show. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Catch up with previous episodes of the show by going to OurAutoExpert.com. You can hear all the past shows, uh, see videos, read about inside car stories in your next ride, and you'll find it all on the website, or go to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and start a conversation with us at Our Auto Expert. We'd love to hear your opinions, and also love to hear what you want to know about. Uh... Volvo has a bunch of new cars coming out this year, including the Polestar versions of their V60, uh, which is their wagon, and also of their XC60, which is the smaller SUV, the midsize SUV, I should say, or the, the medium one. They have an XC40, which is the little one, an XC90, which is the big one, but the middle one. Um, and one of the things they introduced at an event in Banff in Canada, which I got to witness, was their Care by Volvo program. Now, this is generally a subscription program, and I don't know if it would work for you, Jen, where you pay a basic fee a month. It's usually between $700 and $800 a month, and it covers everything except for gas. It covers insurance, maintenance, the car, and you actually own the car, so you're buying the car. Every month you pay that money. And then what they do is they do all that maintenance when it comes up. But they've also introduced a couple of new things with that program, which I absolutely love. First of all, tow for life. If you buy a Volvo now, any Volvo, you can tow it for life. Um, They've also introduced an accident awareness feature as well. And this being accident or an accident feature, this being an accident, uh, September being accident awareness month, I wanted to talk a little bit about that because it's kind of cool. A lot of times we see when you have an accident, car companies know about the accident. They get signaled through uh, the cell phone or the internet that's in the car. 
Uh, Volvo took it a step further, and we're going to get out more details about this because there's like eight steps to this program that they do. Um, but they they will send you a step by step uh, idea of where to go and what to do if you've had an accident. GM General Motors have their OnStar system. Do you have that in any of your cars? Mm-mm. OnStar is kind of cool. Yeah, it's amazing. Because, because the the one the funniest ones are the guys from Modern Family do the ad where they lock uh, Lily in the car, uh, the baby in the car, and OnStar opens the car for them. Uh, you know, Cam's running at the car with a trash can, screaming, trying to open the, uh, and smash the window. I've never seen that. It's, show. Oh, it's one of the best. Oh, you never see Modern Family? <gasps> oh, Jack! <laughs> Nick, like, I work all the time. It's only like the best comedy ever. I'm sorry. Um, it's 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 really good. Uh, anyway, so the OnStar system I think is great, but OnStar had a recent survey that uh, said that more people push the OnStar button to report an accident which they witnessed than they get uh, the signals from the system that says, hey, the airbags have been deployed, which I think that's interesting. It's like a one-button 911 inside the great. car. Um, more, more people doing that. The airbags deploy uh, and they can do things like unlock the car. Right. Now, it's interesting that on, nobody else has come up with OnStar. Like other car companies have come up with their sort of versions of it but not. it's not been as successful as OnStar has. No, and it's, the, OnStar has been around for what? 10? Older than I am. Years? Over 20 years, I think. Older than you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that... I think Infinity came up with that. Infinity have a kind of a good system. They have a concierge system where you can push the button in the car, and uh, it connects you to their concierge, and the concierge will answer any question. Okay, that's cool. So Kyle from Infinity was driving uh, his kids home. He has three girls. He was driving them home from school, and one of them had a question at the homework, and he pressed it, and uh, he got answers for the kids' homework. Wait a minute. Mercedes has that. They do? Oh, yeah, they have Hey Mercedes. Mm -hmm. Hey Mercedes. If you're driving Mercedes right now listening to the radio, Hey Mercedes. Yeah. It's going off, isn't it? (laughs) You can actually change a BMW, say, you can have Hey BMW. Really? You can't. I will tell you, I would change the, the they, call it, they call it the summons word, the word that summons the, the, the system. It's like saying, hey, Alexa. Right. Uh, or hey, Google. Ah! <laughs> my phone just went off. <laughs> uh, it's like the, the hey, whatever. Um, that, so you can customize it? Yeah, you can customize the word, which I think is much better because I was sitting in the car. Of course, you're on these ride and drives. So we, they fly us to some amazing places. We go on these ride and drives. Are you rolling your eyes? A few times. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they, you want to talk about the car with the person you're driving it with. And, of course, every time you say Mercedes, right. it goes, Bip, what do you want? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, this sort of thing. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, but Mercedes actually has a sense of humor. If you yeah. have one, ask her to tell you a joke. That's all yeah. I can tell you. I'm not and telling she, you anything else. No, tell them the joke. What does she say? No. What, she tells. She has hundreds of jokes. Okay. One of them is. She says, my engineers are German. I can't. I yeah, can't. Yeah, I can't not, tell you a joke. Yeah, I can't tell you a joke. I'm sorry. I can't do that. My engineers were German. There you go. Uh, God, you sound my, just like her. My, <laughs> my brother-in-law has a, has a funny joke about the Germans. I'm sorry if you're German, but I'm going to tell you a German joke now. He has a funny joke about the Germans. He goes, I... I Often someone will go, who wouldn't find that funny? He goes, the Germans. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he always says that. The Germans wouldn't find it funny. They're, they're, they're known for having a lack of sense of humor, as Mercedes will tell you. Right, if exactly. You ask her. Uh, BMW have the same system, but they're not. OnStar's seems to be a lot more. Although Mercedes had to doctor their version, because it would go to the internet and find whatever you asked for. Uh oh. Yeah, we did that once. We have it on video. Oh, <laughs> was a kid. wow. We asked it some things that were inappropriate, and she told us everything with graphic detail. Okay. Yeah, so they, is there you, a parental if you guidance have kids on that? Kids in the car, <laughs> make sure that you activate the parental controls on the Hey Mercedes <laughs> because it could be bad. Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, yeah, no, she, it was, so, I laughed so hard, I asked to be taken home. <laughs> <laughs> Take me home, I can't laugh anymore. Accident Awareness Month, September. Um, so all of these new systems coming into cars where the car can actually send help and do things for you and tell you what to do. Um, we have reached out to Volvo because we want them to tell us more about the Care by Volvo system. 
Um, but there are a whole slew of these new systems coming online. As the technology integrates with things like Amazon Alexa, you, uh, what did I see that, um, that all of the new Fords now will have Amazon Alexa, and Lexus now has it in the, you know that RCF track edition that we drove oh, around to the I'm sun? I'm so in love with that car. That, that $100,000 uh, Lexus RCF. $57,000 beauty. Oh, yeah, it was expensive. Oh, it was beautiful. I have to tell you stories about that car later. But we'll save those for <laughs> off the air. Uh, that has Amazon Alexa in it. Cool. Because you do not want to take your hands off the wheel at 100 plus no. miles an hour to make a shopping list. Not at all. Ever. Nope. <laughs> Ever in any how, car. How would you sorry. even be thinking about groceries when you're driving that car? I'd, Seriously. Well, I drive it aggressively all the time, so I think <sighs> about many different things. It's beautiful. That's all I can think of the road and uh, the engine. And the sound. Oh, yeah. And the red Alcantara. And the, and the red Alcantara, and the red carpet, <laughs> and the red headliner, and the fan. And the carbon seat. fiber. Right. More, more Our Auto Expert coming up. <laughs> You're listening to Our Auto Expert. On Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram, start a conversation with us at Our Auto Expert, or catch up on previous episodes of the show at our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all the past shows, see our automotive videos from television, and also read inside car stories about your next ride at ourautoexpert.com. He's, uh, he's been on the show before, and he's back again because he's so darn entertaining. Uh, Brian Armistead is here. Uh, Brian, you, uh, you've been driving a little bit of Land Rover, Range Rover recently. It's really hard to focus on that when uh, the new Defender just announced, and it's pretty much uh, frenzy, feeding frenzy over the new Defender, isn't it? You know, Nick and Jen, I, I have to tell you that I, I harken back to a couple of years ago at the Washington, D.C. Auto Show when Volkswagen was introducing their new Atlas. And at the time, they were still selling the Volkswagen Touareg, and I walked over to Mark Gillies, who was one of the uh, media uh, heads for Volkswagen, and I said, you'll never sell another Touareg as soon as the Atlas hits <laughs> the market. <laughs> And that was true. I mean, as soon as the Atlas hit the market, the Touareg pretty much faded away. Right. My prediction for the Evoque is that once the Defender, the Defender 90 and the Defender 110 come out strong, and there's just, as you know, I think there's just been a craze about these cars. They've been around since 1948. They're back in the U.S. market. I think it's going to be the death knell for the Range Rover Evoque, which is a terrific SUV in its own right. So let's get. I want to talk about the Evoque in, in, in a second because I think they've done an amazing job with it. But, but I look at this. I've you know I've read all the materials. I've watched all the videos about the Defender, the ninety, and the one hundred and ten. The one hundred and ten being the four door, the longer wheelbase, and the ninety being the shorter wheelbase, the two door. I've seen all the videos. I have in depth studied this vehicle in depth, and I think. I think what it does is it sets the ground for things like the new Bronco. I think it sets the ground for things like the new Jeep, uh, Wagoneer, all these new sort of bulky big SUVs that are coming, all these rough and ready off-roader zombie apocalypse uh, vehicles that are coming. I think it, what it does is there's going to be a frenzy of this. There's going to be a frenzy of these uh, Wrangler-type vehicles coming to the United States because everybody just loves them they you know the, the rumor is they're discontinuing the toyota land cruiser right now that means that they're setting the ground for an amazing new forerunner an amazing new land cruiser and and the the defender as well and it, i think what's going to sacrifice is the luxury versions is going to be like they're doing with the defender a very base version that'll be about fifty thousand dollars forty fifty thousand dollars very base all the basics that can do great off-roading all the way up to an eighty thousand dollar version which will be luxury and it'll replace sort of sort of luxury vehicles that are sit in that marketplace today well i think to put the range rover any range rover and a bronco in the same class or even in the class of a jeep i mean i love the jeep wrangler i absolutely love it it's one of the most terrific off-road vehicles i've ever driven but it doesn't carry the status of a range rover a land rover a g-wagon from mercedes-benz well speaking this new defender 90 and the defender 110 for 50, 50 grand, $59,000, all the way up to 80, as you said, you have that boxy, bulky look that is in vogue right now, all the rage, and you have the status that a lot of people desire. I mean, I have to admit, I just went out and bought a 2011 Range Rover, a Land Rover Range Rover HSE, and part of the reason why I bought it is because I had driven a 
um, Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. And then I looked at the price of the G-Wagon. It was $218,000 for the one I wanted. And I looked at the used prices for the G-Wagon. And I said, well, for half of the price of a used G-Wagon, like a 2004, I can get a 2011, 2012 Land Rover Range Rover. So I have status, I have off-road capability, and I have size because, as you know, I'm a pretty big dude. So all of these things that I require are available, and they're also available in this Range Rover Evoque. And even with my size, Nick, 6'9", 300 pounds, I fit very, very well in the front seat. Now, I do render this five-seat vehicle as a four-seater because, I mean, even with a small child behind me and, you know, with the seat all the way back, it was just impossible for anybody to sit behind me. But Except for Jen. Room. Maybe Jen could fit. I can fit. sit behind you. I don't think so, Jen. <laughs> I mean, I don't even think Jill Cipollillo could fit behind me. And let, 4, 10, 4, so, let, let me. Do you know what? You make yourself sound like Officer Hightower out of Police Academy. <laughs> you sit in the back um, seat. Pretty much. Bubba Smith in the back seat. Exactly. <laughs> no, we recently. It's, it's a terrific. I'm sorry, Jen. Go ahead. It's okay. We recently drove the new G Wagon. And. Um, I found out that they actually have a two-year waiting list for the new design. So it's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, I, mean, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But this Range Rover Evoque is sensational in its own right. They kind of re- they kind of softened that choppy rear exterior look. The, the rear roofline still slopes down, but it does not look as dramatic as on the 2016 uh, Range Rover Evoque, for example. My car was finished in a Nolita gray paint, which was just stunning. It's like a soft matte bluish gray. wasn't metallic, but it wasn't matte. So it was glossy, but it, um, it wasn't like a bright metallic finish. With cloud ebony interior, which is a black-white combination. And folks got inside, and they were just like, wow, this is a stunning vehicle. 21-inch wheels. Visually very, very impressive. I drove the Range Rover HSE. Uh, P400 a couple of weeks ago, and it had a lot of little quirks. It's like little bricks were behind the dashboard, turning things on and off. I mean, the mirrors were folded on their own. The sunroof would open and close on its own. I didn't find any of these electronic maladies in the uh, Range Rover Evoque, and I also found that the start-stop system, which I find obtrusive in most vehicles, is very unobtrusive in the Range Rover Evoque. But I just think the Defender will be the death knell for the Evoque, because you know, why would you buy an Evoque when you can buy a Defender for the same money and have kind of like the latest craze car, uh, much like uh, Toyota, you know, the Super when they came out. Everybody wants one. But um, this is a chance to get a real Range Rover, not a BMW uh, Toyota, a real Range Rover for a very, very reasonable price. I was stunned when they came out with the price points, uh, Nick and Jen. Yeah. It, it, you know why you like it so much, Brian? Because it was designed by a woman. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that Jen told me to say that, by the yeah. way. She sh- yeah, the whole... I've always wanted a Defender. I mean, I, you know, my neighbor in 1997 uh, bought a Range Rover Defender, a Land Rover Defender. I think he paid like thirty two nine for the car. He still has it, and it's worth about $74,000, $75,000. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's an, it's an iconic uh, Land Rover, and it just... It just ticks all the boxes for me. I've, I've been looking so, at all, all the old Defenders to buy. 1996 is when they stopped bringing them into the United States because they didn't meet U.S. safety standards. And the interesting thing about it is I, uh, I started to think about these vehicles. Now, you can find them. I found one for that only had 20,000 miles on it, and it was $130,000. And then you can find them with 130,000 miles on them, and they're still about $40,000. So it's it's almost impossible to buy of the old ones. So when the new one comes, I think uh, people will be paying silly money for them because they are just absolutely amazing vehicles, and it's sort of everything everybody wants. Let's jump back to the Evoque. I got an opportunity to drive the Evoque in Europe um, earlier this year. And I didn't think there was that much wrong with the Evoque in the first place. Apart from the two-door, it was really hard to see out of the back. That was the only glaring error in that vehicle, or glaring things that was a problem. But I'll tell you, they've done enough to that vehicle to take it from a good little vehicle to be absolutely amazing. Like, I'm I'm blown away about how well it drives, about how well it's styled, about how well it's finished. And, you know, if, if Land Rover, Range Rover managed to keep that vehicle out 
of the shop, which has been a problem for some of their older vehicles, they're in the shop quite right. regularly. If they manage to make a vehicle that doesn't have to visit the shop where you're paying a lot of money to keep an older version of it, I think they would have a winner. But I think you also have a point with uh, this could be the crashing down of it with that uh, brand new Defender. Well, that's the point I tried to make with the uh, Range Rover. I mean, you know, I wasn't really pleased when the power mirrors just folded on their own. I didn't touch a thing. They just did it when I hit a bump. And also the uh, sunscreen just started to close on its own. But I didn't find, in my week of testing the uh, Evoke, I found no gremlins, no right. electronic maladies. Right. Right. And the 246 horsepower yeah. turbocharged intercooled uh, four, it really has a lot of good performance. I drove the first edition, which has a base price of 56,850. Out the door, it was 59,215. Brian, we're, cra we're crashing in. We're, we're crashing into the news, but I thank you for your review, right. and uh, I can't wait to have you back on again. You're listening to our auto expert. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert podcast. Welcome back to our auto expert, our locally created, nationally celebrated. Uh, this week's show is available for re-listening and to all the previous shows at ourautoexpert.com. You can also uh, find more at social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all under our auto expert. He joins us every single week to discuss the state of the market and what's going on as far as uh, electric cars, the future of cars, and business is concerned. Anton Woolman, and he is on the phone today. He's an independent analyst and investor. Um, Anton, an awful lot going on. So let's start a little bit with the new Porsche Taycan, because one of the biggest pieces of controversy over this vehicle is the fact that it's called a turbo, yet it's an electric vehicle. Uh, Misnomenclature by Porsche or intentional? Well, uh, think about TurboTax. There's no turbo in that one either, and that's a piece of software. So All right. I would not. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, the people who make fun out of uh, Porsche calling this thing a turbo, I think they've missed uh, the boat on modern culture just a little bit. The reality is that all turbo means it's faster than the item that doesn't have the word turbo on it. And if you call it the Turbo S, it, the S means that it's even faster than the regular turbo. And by faster, I also mean more expensive. So that's really where we're at at this point. Much has been made about the spec wars, really, between Porsche and, in this case, Tesla, who has the most horsepower, who can charge the fastest, who can have the longest range on electric, who can move around a racetrack such as a Laguna Seco or a Nuremberg Ring in Germany the fastest. But... You know, many, much of these things uh, will pale in comparison to what maybe other concerns that buyers will have, such as service and reliability. I mean, how fast does a car do zero to 60 uh, that sits in the shop? The answer is uh, maybe in a month. So right. whether it's two seconds, three or four or five seconds, if the car is in the shop, the car ain't going nowhere. What's the range of a car that's in the shop right now? Well, it's zero. So the world of electric cars will start, I think, to move on from some of these spec wars to uh, does the car actually work? Can it be serviced? How much time of its uh, time alive does it spend in the shop? And I think that what Porsche is eventually going to be selling cars based upon is not only design. The car is spectacularly beautiful in person. No pictures make it justice. I just had a lot of quality time in front of a half a dozen Taycans, uh, white, blue, and red alike, and uh, the car is spectacular, but it will also move on to things like reliability and service. So I think that's where the market is moving. Okay, and do you think that uh, this is going to be the top of the bar, or do you think that there's somebody going to come out with a more sort of be a better performance, a better election? Because well, the Model S was probably the premium or one of the premium vehicles when it came out. It's uh, now there's you know a lot of other car companies that have electric performance cars. Do you think Porsche is going to be the sought after pinnacle of the performance electric cars, just the same as they are with their 911? Or do you think somebody's going to come out with something on the other side of this, which is more premium, more you know faster, etc.? In the near term, this will be a battle between Porsche and Tesla. I think that Tesla will uh, it'll have the longest range in terms of the zero to 60 performance. They'll still probably be the, the fastest by a hair and that sort of thing. 
uh, as to who can make itself around a racetrack the fastest. I think that'll be a close call. It's very hard to beat Porsche on things like handling. Uh, so uh, I, I don't really see anybody else in the very short term that is going to match uh, these two companies. So uh, I think that's where it stands for at least the next uh, one to two years. What about sales of the Porsche? Um, you know, Tesla, obviously, uh, their sales have dropped quite a lot of the Model S, and they keep doing things to uh, boost their sales from the initial uh, launch of the vehicle. But Porsche's brand new. Uh, do you think that Porsche's going to carry the torch? Well, so the Porsche in the beginning here will be quite a bit more expensive. The car starts at a little over $150,000, and if you check all the boxes, it goes well above 200000 So uh, there's a certain limitation in terms of uh, the kind of buyer that would buy the Porsche under any circumstance, no matter how good it is. At some point, some people just aren't going to pay that much of a price premium. However, in just a few sh- few short months from now, we're going to see Porsche coming out with the lower priced variants that are going to be closer to the $100,000 mark. And of course, proportionately speaking, uh, that will uh, enable more people who would have bought a Tesla to go for the Porsche. There will still be some impact. Keep in mind that there are a lot of people who paid $100,000 or maybe slightly more for a Tesla that would have gladly paid $150,000, $200,000 just to have whatever is the hottest thing, the uh, that is out there right. and so uh, the impact on Tesla will they want it will not be zero alright Anton Warman back after the break we'll talk VW and the Frankfurt Auto Show on our Auto Expert you're listening to our Auto Expert And Tom Warman on the phone with us. He is an independent investor and analyst. We're talking about some of the changes that came out of the Frankfurt Auto Show. Volkswagen introduces its volume bespoke electric car called the ID3. But there's some question about when it will arrive in the United States, if ever. Yeah, so what Volkswagen has done here is that they've produced their first from the ground up electric exclusive vehicle. You may know that Volkswagen has already had two pure electric cars under the Volkswagen brand, the E-Up, which we have never seen in the United States, and the E-Golf, which has been sold here for several years now, and it's been a quite a big sales success in Europe over the last two years in particular. But this one uh, is a new electric vehicle of which there will be no internal combustion variant, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, nothing. It will only be a pure electric vehicle. So the very first such variant to come out in this series of what is eventually going to be almost 30 different variants will only be sold in the European market. And this is the version that, for all practical purposes, kind of looks like a Volkswagen Golf. Uh, It turns out that here in the United States, most people simply don't buy these types of small practical hatchbacks that automotive journalists like you and I tend to love. The population in general doesn't love them. We love them. The reality is that there is no business case for Volkswagen to have the pricing power that would be necessary to make money on this type of body style in the United States. So as a result, we are going to get approximately one year later, think of it as January 1st, 2021, the SUV variant of this vehicle instead. And this SUV will look like pretty much, I saw it just a few days ago, uh, it looks like pretty much any other SUV in the market. Pick anyone, almost anyone, from an Audi e-tron to a Volkswagen Tiguan to a Kia Sportage, pick an Audi Q5. It will look like any of these vehicles, and uh, it will uh, be exported initially for the first couple of years from Germany to the United States and go on sale here in the U.S. at the very beginning of 2021. So, I mean, VW, and this sort of was born out of the uh, the Dieselgate crisis where uh, they were found to be cheating on their diesel numbers, an embarrassing situation for them, but it really canceled the diesel program, especially here in the United States uh, and somewhat in the rest of the world, and then spawned this massive injection of uh, you know electric vehicles because this was their one way of setting this, the table straight and the table right. They seem to be so far ahead of everybody else. E- you know, even with if D- Dieselgate had never happened, would VW be as far advanced with their electric vehicles as they are today? 
Well, so I think you have to make a distinction here between committing to making some electric cars and making them attractive and committing to selling huge numbers of them. I think what really changed with Dieselgate and uh, in particular the legislation that followed in a variety of jurisdictions around the world, ranging from China to the 13 states in the United States where they have mandated electric car sales to Europe most recently, is that they're really mandating huge volumes of sales. Volkswagen as a group had already committed to electric cars. For example, the Porsche Taycan and the Audi e-tron had already been decided on before Dieselgate broke. I mean, those programs were uh, set in stone back in uh, 2013 and early 2014. Those were done at that point. And that was over a year before Dieselgate. So uh, Volkswagen's commitment here to this particular platform, the lower-cost electric car platform, uh, that was really a volume commitment, saying that, well, we're not just going to put a few cars out there and see, you know, maybe they won't sell as many of them, but this is all about uh, coming to a point where uh, they will respond to the legislative requirements to sell a very high percentage of their total fleet in the form of pure electric cars. So that's really the distinction going forward. Now, you know, there's a lot of car companies that are introducing various different electric vehicles, especially at Frankfurt, where a lot of them are unveiled. But we still seem to be lacking in a lot of them coming to the United States. Honda, perfect example of this. Uh, you know, they uh, unveiled new electric vehicles, amazing interior in their new uh, electric vehicle, but again, doesn't come to the United States. Yeah, clearly some of these electric vehicles are optimized for some markets only. You will see many electric cars that are sold in China only, some Europe only, and in the United States, because Americans tend to love far larger vehicles, some will uh, be emphasized more for the U.S. consumption. So in the case of Honda, their cute little city car here, which has an amazing interior, by the way, probably one of the best interiors I've ever seen on any car ever. It's very tasteful. I mean, it's one of the few that have blended modern technology with some classical elegance in terms of materials and have pulled that off very well. Uh, Honda supposedly asked uh, their American uh, subsidiary, can you please take this car in the United States? And they were told we don't want it. And the reason they don't want it is because Americans generally do not like cars this small and that have this little range. I mean, this car is going to come out and have a range of approximately 135 miles in the United States, but as a result, it will not make it to the United States. There will be other Honda, Honda models starting in uh, 2021 and that will make it to the U.S. instead. Uh, Mercedes unveiling their V-Class, which is uh, the minivan. Again, does that have a place here or is it just something for Europe? Well, initially, that car will be for Europe only. So this is the their minivan that uh, we've had here in the United States that is called the Metris when they sell it in the U.S. And in Europe, it's called the V-Class or the Vito, depending on the uh, application of sort of work versus personal use. And it's a very attractive vehicle. It's actually my favorite Mercedes by far. I absolutely love this thing. And um, yeah, they've now made an all-electric variant of it. And uh, uh, they were a bit fuzzy on the details in terms of when it will be out, but it'll, it's clear that it's going to be for Europe only to begin with. But this is the kind of vehicle that, oh, in, in the fullness of time, give it a couple of years, and uh, you should not exclude the possibility that it will make it to the U.S. Americans would consider buying this thing, and uh, we won't see it in the U.S. in 2020, that's for sure, but sometime thereafter, uh, it might make it to the United States. I think that uh, you know, VW, or sorry, Mercedes have had a few false starts with uh, minivans in the United States. The R um, didn't really take off here, uh, which is sort of the, I guess, was their jump into the United States with a sort of minivan-esque uh, vehicle. Um, and it, it was a great vehicle, but didn't really take off. Do people not associate uh, Mercedes with, you know, as a luxury brand in the United States, really with this sort of more vans, which they're famous for in the rest of the world, obviously, and they sell a lot of sprinters here. But it seems like every time they try to do a, you know, a, a family version of that, it doesn't quite take off here. No, in in Europe, of course, Mercedes is very much a commercial vehicle. So many trucks are Mercedes's. Look at the taxi cab fleets across large swaths of Europe, and Mercedes is a very large player there. 
So in, this is essentially the large taxi cab in Europe. And of course, for small uh, sort of small entrepreneurs of various types, from uh, carpenters to uh, uh, flower shops to uh, wedding cakes or whatever, uh, the, this type of minivan in Europe is very, very popular. So Mercedes has a big business there. And uh, they've just moved some of that production to the United States here in the last year in order to try to spur sales of this product in the U.S. But the numbers are are still small here. But I do see that over time here, I think people will uh, here in the United States come to like this product more and more. And I'm I'm actually pretty bullish that it will work out over over time. And and as part of that program, I do think that three or four years from now, at the most, we will have the all electric version of this product here in the United States as well. Uh, Audi uh, announces they will unveil the e-tron sportsback on November the 19th, uh, which is also when manufacturing begins. Uh, interesting. Uh, this was the vehicle that was in the uh, the Marvel uh, movie, right? Yeah, so the e-tron sportback is a sim- simply a different uh, body style on top of the exact same underpinnings as the current Audi e-tron that uh, has been sold here in the United States since uh, late April. And uh, what it does is that it essentially creates a rear end of the vehicle that looks more like a little bit of a coupe. So just like uh, Mercedes and uh, BMW, in particular BMW, pioneered with the X6 many years ago, and uh, most automotive journalists scoffed at this thing saying, wow, this is completely impractical. But for some crazy reason, the general public ten- tends to like them. They they pay good money for them, and it's a way to say, hey, I want to sit higher up. I want to have something that's sort of an SUV but it looks a little bit like a coupe in the back, but it's also a four-door. It hits all, it's hit a lot of touch points for a lot of people, and uh, this will be made on the exact same production line as the Audi e-tron. will probably cost about the same, and we'll probably expand the market just a little bit for Audi. So uh, this uh, vehicle should show up in the United States no later than June of 2020, probably a little bit in the middle of the spring there, and uh, probably uh, sell a few hundred units a month in here in the U.S. Now, some of us got to see this at further with Ford, their future of Ford car company they had last year, but they uh, showed us a mock-up of what uh, looked like uh, their first, they were calling it, I think, the Mark 1, just as a working title, but it's their Mustang crossed electric SUV. That's likely to be unveiled at the LA Auto Show. Yeah, I mean, this is if, if, when it comes to electric cars, there are a few cars that will be coming online in 2020 that excite me more than the Ford uh, so-called Mustang-inspired uh, crossover SUV that goes into production in Mexico in April and should be in U.S. dealerships starting in the third quarter of 2020. Uh, this will have a range of at least 300 miles here in the U.S., which will be better than anybody but Tesla and basically almost touching the Tesla Model X in terms of range. But I think it will sell on uh, design and uh, reliability and overall performance. I mean, I think that this, and you know, they afford it's also likely to, I think, price this thing reasonably well so that it doesn't show up as one of those $70,000-plus vehicles, but rather it could end up having a price that's below $70,000. And uh, I think that people will be shocked at what Ford brings out here. I think it will really help elevate the Ford brand well over and above its current image uh, all around the world, not just here in the U.S., but also in Europe, uh, where uh, Ford expects to export this vehicle in a decent volume from uh, the Mexico plant to where it will be produced starting this upcoming April. I, I'm not, I would not agree with you more. I think that uh, looking at it, it looks like it hit the mark where the Model X had failed for Tesla. I think that uh, it's the right size for most families in the United States. The fact that it doesn't have a combustion engine in the front or the back means that you'll have a lot more cabin space. Uh, for instance, the I-Pace having as much interior room as the XJ, uh, but yet being the same exterior size as the F-Pace. Uh, these vehicles now, uh, this this is the world is ready. The world is prime. The electric uh, charging centers are being built all over the world thanks to Electrify America. I think Ford are well positioned to do this. Do you any idea of what the price you think it'll be? No, there have been very much. Here's the thing that when it comes to electric cars. Uh, you can see them in many different variants depending on the size of the battery. So you could easily see that about 100 kilowatt hours worth of a battery size with all-wheel drive and all the bells and whistles, this thing could certainly be well above $70,000. But you could also see that a uh, version with a slightly smaller battery, say 70 kilowatt hours, and right. maybe with a little bit less equipment, maybe even with the rear-wheel drive only, could easily come in at 
uh, just below sixty thousand dollars, like fifty nine thousand dollars. I think that is a reasonable range for this sold. vehicle as it uh, makes it to market in the middle of twenty twenty. I'm telling you, sold. Anton, where can we read your stuff? Mostly on SeekingAlpha.com and also on TheStreet.com. Anton Warman, our independent analyst and investor, joins us every week to talk about the status of the market and electric vehicles. We celebrate having him on, and you can catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website, OurAutoExpert.com, or message us on social media until we're here for the next show, which will be next week. A big smile on our face, and make sure you stay out of trouble. You've been listening to Our Auto Expert with Nick Mile. Find all the show episodes at ourautoexpert.com. Please follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Our Auto Expert. And message us for a quick and witty response.